We light this light in the name of the Maker, who lit the world and breathed life into us. We light this light in the name of the Son, who saved the world and stretched out his hand to us. We light this light in the name of the Spirit, who encompasses the world and blessed our souls with yearning. thousands of years, First Nations people have walked in this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. Here on St. Joseph Island, we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe of the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, who are partners with the settler peoples in the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. And we acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. Good morning and welcome to our online worship service for the 4th of June 2023 and a special welcome to those of you joining us from outside of the St. Joseph Island area. I invite you into a time of prayer. Like creation on that first morning, may we tingle with anticipation of your goodness and wonder flowing into our lives, God who shapes all things. May we join all creation in worshiping you, who is as close as a heartbeat. As God whispered into the silence, you ran forth with creatures of every size and shape at your side, word of wonder. As rivers filled the valleys and ran to the seas, as flowers sprang forth in meadows, as grace unfathomable sprang forth, may we join all creation in emulating you, who is as close as our flesh, which you wore. As God's mind overflowed with dreams, you brooded over the waters, stirred the clouds with your wind, Breathe life into all that is, spirit of fanciful faith, planting the seeds of peace. May we join all creation in dancing with you, who is as close to us as every breath we take. May we join all creation, God in community, in worshiping, emulating, dancing as we offer our prayers to you. By God's grace, our chaotic choices become creative grace for others. Our foolishness can be transformed by God's goodness. Our lives can become new by the spirit of our God. The good news is, as true as it was on creation's first morning, creator God is the redeeming word who is the breath of life for all people, even us. Thanks be to God for forgiveness and grace in our lives. Amen.
I have two pieces of scripture to read this morning. The first is taken from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Paul writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Our second reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Matthew writes, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always. To the end of the age. This is offered as God's wisdom for our journey. May we walk in its truth. It's Trinity Sunday and we are approaching the date of the 98th anniversary of the founding of our United Church of Canada. Now, I'm sure that many of my ministry colleagues are probably delighted to have such an excuse to avoid the expectation that they should say something meaningful about the doctrine of the Trinity. I could easily do that. The Hebrew scripture reading for today is the creation story. For that to come up close to the church anniversary could invite a reflection on the God who created this denomination and says it is good. But I'm not going to jump that way. I am inclined to think that the coinciding of the two is a rather fruitful opportunity for a preacher, and I want to try to say something of value about both and the relationship between them. It has become common to speak of the Trinity, sometimes rather dismissively, as a mystery. Now, there is a technical sense in which it is correct to call it a mystery, but often it is not said in that technical sense at all, but just in the more common sense of being something that is too strange to be understood or to be expected to make any sense to anyone at all. It is thus seen as something we are expected to believe to be true even though we have given up any hope of understanding it. And preachers routinely avoid it because many of them have given up too. Mystery becomes just a more attractive word for an unsolvable theological puzzle. But actually, that isn't the way the New Testament writers use the word mystery. When the Apostle Paul speaks of the mystery of God, 
It is as something which was once hidden, but which has now been revealed or made known in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. The mysteries are things which have been made known to us, not things which are so baffling that we'd best not worry our pretty little heads about them. The reading we heard from the gospel this morning gives a little snapshot of the impact of this revelation of the mystery of God in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. As we heard at the close of the story, after the crucifixion and resurrection, the disciples are now said to worship Jesus. Some still doubt it, it says, but that only adds emphasis to the significance of what they were doing, worshiping Jesus as God. They knew the commandments. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only. And they knew what they were doing now. And here, in the same passage, we have the clearest naming of the Trinity in the whole Bible. When Jesus commissions them to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But what is it about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus that unveils the mystery of God and reveals the nature of the Trinity to us? Well, without wishing to dodge back into the baffling mystery cop-out, there is a lot more to it than I can unpack in one short sermon. There is no reason, though, why I shouldn't be able to give you a worthwhile taste. In the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are witnessing the action of the Trinity, and the Gospel descriptions indeed use Trinitarian language. Jesus, the Son, is said to commend or give up his spirit to the Father. Son, Spirit, Father. And once the death is described in those terms, there's no meaningful way to speak of the resurrection that doesn't include the Father giving the Spirit back to the Son. Without the Spirit, there is and can be no life. But what is revealed in this is by no means just the identities of the persons of the Trinity. Far more importantly, it is the nature of the relationships of the Trinity within which we discover the nature of God. It reveals that God is not who we thought God was. And perhaps this is a danger when preachers begin to shy away from the Trinity and call it a baffling mystery. Perhaps we risk veiling again that which was unveiled and made known to us. And if we do that, we begin to interpret the crucifixion in dangerous ways. We revert to thinking of the Father as a vengeful God, who demands the blood of a violent punishment, even of an innocent victim, before he will turn away his anger. And if that were true of God, then we are justified in violently repressing those whose sins provoke God's anger, because our actions can be seen as being sanctioned by God and reflecting God's nature. But on the cross, as Jesus gives up his spirit to the Father, we see none of that. We catch sight of a relationship of tender intimacy, a relationship of grace, of love, of compassion. We see the suffering love of a grieving father losing his son, and the gracious love of a merciful son forgiving even his own murderers and the passionate love of a communing spirit passing between the two and subsequently back to give life even in death. We see a God who does not demand victims but is willing to become one. 
we see a God who takes no satisfaction in any death, but grieves over every death. We see a God who is all love and mercy and intimate communion. And this is the revealing of the mystery, the making known of that which had been hidden. Now, part of what is so significant about that, and this is where I begin to get some sort of connection with our church anniversary, is that what it reveals to us about the triune nature of God is not so much about the nature of the three persons of the Trinity, but about the nature of the three relationships between them. The three are not one God so much in their identity as three individual persons, but in the three relationships that bind them together. It is in the relationships that are seen in the intimate moment of death on the cross, the relationship between a grieving father and a suffering son, between a dying son and his offered up spirit, and between a creating father and his sent forth life-giving spirit. It is the nature of these three relationships rather than the nature of the individual persons that makes them the Trinity. It is these relationships that we are called to reflect in our gathered life. You can hear this in the words we heard from the Apostle Paul. Brothers and sisters, agree with one another, live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. There is this emphasis on the nature of the Trinity when Paul is calling us to relate to one another in particular ways, to be the church of the triune God it's not enough to simply gather a number of people in a church building and hold a worship service. The communion of the Holy Spirit that Paul calls for is not about the sum of the individuals, just as the Trinity is not just about the sum of the individual persons. It's about the relationships between them, in as much as the relationships between us reflect the grace and self-giving of the Trinity, then we are the church. This doesn't mean that we all need to be best buddies. This is a common misconception about churches. We are called to love one another and respect one another and treat one another with grace and mercy. If we also happen to like each other, that's a bonus. Remember that Jesus calls us to love even our enemies. So you can be sure that he's not saying that love is dependent on having warm, fuzzy feelings toward one another. If you do like each other, loving each other is certainly easier. But you are called to love one another regardless. You are not called to pretend to be the Father, Son, or Spirit. But together, we are called to reflect the patterns of their relating in the ways we relate to one another. What constitutes the Father, Son, and Spirit as God is the nature of the relationships between them. And what will constitute us as a genuine church is the nature of the relationships between us and the way they mirror those of the Trinity. We are called to be a Trinity-shaped community, to live out the life of the Trinity in our shared life together. That quest has been underway in our denomination for 98 years, inasmuch as we do. Thus, we are truly the United Church. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh, no.
Once again, I invite you to join with me in prayer. Holy God, we come with our prayers of thanks. We thank you for the summer, which finally seems to be here. The leaves on the trees are completely out, the grass is green, and people are outside in t-shirts and shorts once more. Thank you for flowers and birds and seeds that have been planted in gardens. Thank you, O God, that you are in the changes. Thank you that you are with us in all transformations of life. How blessed we are to have you by our sides every moment of every day. When we feel alone, remind us of your presence. When we need assurance, speak to us in soft whispers of love. When we need comfort, touch us with your healing balm of forgiveness and salvation. As Paul taught us, we pray for all people, and although we could not possibly name them all today, we think of a few in our hearts. Give us, O oh God, the faithfulness to pray for those we don't particularly like, lifting them up to you as your much-loved children. We remember also those in positions of authority over us and ask for your wisdom and grace to be in their lives. Enable us to pray more for those whose responsibilities are greater. We pray for those who mourn this day and for those who are in need of your healing presence. May your healing and strength ripple through them like an ever-flowing stream of grace. There are times in our lives when we need direction. There are times when we stumble and fall, especially in those times. Help us to follow your leadership without hesitation or reservation, for we know that your wisdom and knowledge are greater than ours. Enable us to place our trust in your unfailing love in every situation. To you, holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit belongs all glory, honor, and worship, now and forever. Hear us now as we pray in the words that Jesus taught us. May the God of love and justice accompany us. May the Spirit surround us with grace and peace as we walk the way of the Christ. Let all those who do justice and love kindness say, Amen. Shalom, everybody. We'll see you next week.